Hey everyone, before we get to today's episode, I wanted to share some exciting news here that we have over at Primary Source Media. We are launching a brand new daily podcast called Historical Birthdays Today. It's exactly what it sounds like. Every day, we'll be sharing a bite-sized episode featuring a historical birthday that happened on that date. So if you like history or have a birthday, I'm sure you'll like the show. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. There are four faces on Mount Rushmore. Two are founding fathers. One saved the union, and the other has a mustache. Theodore Roosevelt was an aristocrat, cowboy, Harvard grad, rough rider, trust-busting asthmatic. He may just be one of America's most interesting, contradictory, and impactful leaders. Today, we talk about TR with the host of History That Doesn't Suck, Professor Greg Jackson. This is Too Complicated for History. guest, Dr. Greg Jackson, is creator, host, and head writer of the podcast History That Doesn't Suck, and an associate professor at Utah Valley University. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Greg. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. So my first question for you is about your fantastic title for your podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. And I feel like there has to be a good story behind that. It, the implication is that there is a lot of history that do, does suck. Right? Well, right. Y- y- or the implication is that I'm setting a really low bar for myself. I'm not promising it's great, only that it doesn't suck. That's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, that's true. That's um, true. <laughs> more seriously, uh, look, uh, w- this podcast uh, of mine it's it's a rigorously researched history of the United States. Uh, it basically, it's the survey course that w- we wish. Professors wish they had the the luxury of teaching as I, you know, do one episode every other week and over the course of half a decade have now just gotten into World War One. Right. It's it's the deep dive that you can't do. It's impossible given the constraints we have uh, in terms of time in the classroom. Um, but as, as loved as it is by a lot of history fans, I'm really trying to talk to people who think they don't like history and they think they don't like history because they had a bad experience with it, either K through 12, or maybe it was in college with uh, an instructor or, or a curriculum that really took the joy out of it, where it's just names and dates and you didn't really connect with individuals in history. I think keeping the story part of history is just as vital as the analysis that we do as professors in, in our articles and our, our books, uh, because that's where people actually connect, especially those who aren't drawn to the discipline in the first place. So it's irreverent. It's intentionally irreverent in, in that title. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to convey that this is not going to be like the teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And so far, it seems, it seems to have gotten the right message across for the most part. Oh, absolutely. I think it's amazing how much work you put into each episode. You're basically writing an <laughs> academic, not, ac- you know, it's obviously it's yeah. not the dry academic article, but what is the equivalent of an academic article every other week? I yes. mean, that's just impressive. Thank you. Um, it's uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes a little much. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember what a weekend is. And um, I, like, you know, Father's Day was just this last weekend, my kids come in the morning. Happy Father's Day. Oh, right. It's Father's Day. Let me put this down for a minute. And let's <laughs> so I just, it's the only way I can make even this schedule work, uh, cranking right. out at, at that rate and trying to keep it at that caliber. But thank you so much for the kind compliments. Yes, yeah, incredibly. It's the best scored survey, of course, that I think I've ever heard. You know, I say like the music, the way you you're, you yeah. really do a great job, and especially coming from a film background, in setting that story and, and, and you know, using all the tools at your disposal, you know, even ambiently to set the scene um, and oh, set the tone yeah. of, 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 of what's going on. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Well, cause, and, and for that, uh, Isaac, I, I've got to just say thank you to my partners over at Airship. Um, they are, I, I, I write 
and then read off, you know, basically this not dry article uh, to put it in academic terms, you know, into the mic and Airship then handles, uh, yes, I've, I contributed on the, on the music side, but, um, they're the ones that do all the sound design for every episode. And, uh, I give them direction and there are plenty of times where they don't do what I suggested and it is way better. Uh, so, you know, they, they know, <laughs> I always tell them, guys, this is just my thought. If you think it needs a different, you know, we need a different score than the one I have in mind, or that's, you know, too many explosions in this battle. It's time to do something different. Yeah. And they always kill it. So sure. I'm really grateful to, you got to have good partners in this, in this game. For sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So to get to the history of what we wanted to talk about, uh, yeah. as, you know, as, I feel like we could talk about your podcast. All, everyone should just go listen. You know, if you're listening right now, <laughs> yes, I mean, don't turn listen. this podcast off right now, but after <laughs> this is done, go listen to history that doesn't talk. You know, no, just no, wait, I just thought we were going to compliment me all day. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> thank you. This will get less embarrassing for me. Yeah. Let's shift. Let's I, go. I, I, I will say, so like the, one of the reasons I said that, and this is one of the episodes that you um, uh, recommended us listening, taking a look at uh, based because of the subject of Teddy Roosevelt, um, who is a really interesting uh, figure for me because he is, because so I'm, I'm admittedly not an academic. I don't come from an academic background. I'm a fan of history, uh, very interested in the subject, but don't have any formal training or, or education in there. But, you know, Roosevelt is a, a car like a cartoon almost in my head. He almost like he, yeah. He's like, literally, I was trying to picture who I was or think of who I was picturing when I was listening to the podcast. I was like, I can't, I don't know why I have a very distinct image. And then I realized afterwards uh, that it was uh, Robin Williams from night at the museum. Like that's the, the caricature. That's how caricature he is in my brain. Uh, and you know what? I got to say, I enjoyed Robin Williams depiction of him. Um, right. <laughs> re really good. I, uh, I don't know if I'm going to say, well, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. I, I enjoyed it. I, I did not see that as a historian. Go like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I thought he brought a really fun, goofy, but right feel uh, to this very bombastic, larger than life uh, figure. Yeah. And so I think what you wanted to get into is your contention was that he's slightly more complicated than that stereotype. Uh, oh, so uh, much more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the whole era, um, you know, he, TR, as he's often known, Theodore Roosevelt. Right. By the way, he hated to be called Teddy, but that's okay. Tr, oh, our boy okay. Tr. Uh, he uh, he occupies this like dead zone, and every every academic, any teacher, even if you've just got you've taken history classes, you know the drill. You've got four months, maybe it's K through twelve, right? So you've got the luxury of covering over two centuries of American history in <laughs> in nine months, right? And luxury that that's in air quotes. You should hear that as I say it. Uh, it's insane, right? So naturally, what always happens is we hit the highlights because that's all the more you have time to do. So we get revolution, uh, something, 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 civil war. Um, there's something called the Gilded Age, uh, uh, World War One for like a day, Great Depression. Uh, we've still fallen behind. World War II, because everyone wants to hear about that. But we're actually going to skip the Pacific Theater because I don't really know much about that. And here's the atomic bomb. Uh, we're really at the end of the year. Um, there was something called the Cold War and Ronald Reagan, French fries, and you know we, we we call it it we call it a year. So we fly through and we skip some very crucial pieces in part because even these, yeah, you know, I I'm not I want to be very clear. I'm not trying to critique the teachers. I think teachers are asked insane things to do. We we get through a bachelor's degree in history, you get hired in uh, in to teach. Uh, I have plenty of former students who are, who are in this right now. A textbook is thrown at them. They're told that they have to. There are standardized tests that they need to keep in mind. So they need to make sure they're teaching things that are applicable to those questions. Otherwise, their students do terrible. This is where some of that suck starts to, to slip in, right? And uh, on top of that, since they, forgive me for saying this, but only have a bachelor's in, in history, which may have had very little to do with whatever the subject they've been asked to teach. So maybe they've taken upper division courses on uh, European history, African history, Asian history, and suddenly they're teaching you know, U.S. history colonies to present. Yeah, there's a there are a lot of gaps in in their own knowledge, and it's not their fault. And there is not time and investment put in, in into building that up in the instructor. Uh, and then even for those who have that that deep knowledge, which comes if they stick with the career, uh, if they didn't already have it. Well, nonetheless, 
it, they're, they're trying to have their students drink from a fire hose. It's impossible. And then once again, those tests drive them to say, I got to fly through the Gilded Age. I got to fly through the progressive era. It gets like a day or two. And naturally, when you do that, you get a two-dimensional take, even if the instructor knows their stuff. Sure. Okay, I'm done tirading. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to admit, I mean, my, my time period throughout my master's and my PhD was Revolutionary Era and Early Republic. And I, I knew some things about, you know, Gilded Age, Progressive Era. I was like, okay, I mean, there's some really interesting things about it. But when I started first, you know, looking at what your podcasts were going to be out and see like J.P. Morgan and we're talking about finances and monopolies, I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll see. This is a good test because, you know, not exactly <laughs> something that I would run to listen to. And I, I got embroiled in it, so fascinated by it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm interested in finance podcast right. like it's okay. so see, interesting see <laughs> and, uh, lynn this is this is what I'm, i i attempt and and you know put my blood sweat and tears into w with this podcast is that i contend all those boring things they are exciting yes. if the story stays in it it's only dull and boring when it turns into uh blankless names i mean jp morgan great so, the name means nothing but if right. you know about this yeah blue blood but very driven, scrappy individual who uh, who who doesn't rest on his laurels. He works hard to to build himself into something bigger and better. His insecurities that the man I forget the name of the condition, but his nose is, is uh, purple. Uh, one of your listeners is undoubtedly. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he's so sensitive about it. Right. And, and so he'll open up the newspapers and there's another political cartoon of him with his nose drawn uh, overly big and, you know, discolored and Oh, it eats at him. He's this very huh. private individual. Uh, he hates being seen in the public in any way, shape, or form. But when you are, you know, the god of of money, yeah, you're going to be in the public, uh, the public arena, whether you like it or not. So when you start getting into those things, you start to know these people, right? That mm -hmm. that's when it comes to life. And uh, you know, to just throw you a, a, a nod, Lynn, one one of my favorite. Uh, examples of this actually is my second episode, which is revolutionary era still. Mm -hmm. And that's Patrick Henry. And yes. I use Patrick Henry to make um, tax policy in the colonies exciting. No one should be excited about tax policies, <laughs> but you are, if you're worried about your boy, Pat, who's been talking some serious, forgive me, we'll say crap. I don't know how strong you <laughs> want me to keep my language or not here, but he's been talking some serious crap about the King. Right. And, and so I can use that to then, oh, okay, this is interesting. All right, fine. I will listen to you talk about how many pence it is to, you know, bring in molasses. But what's right. going on with my boy Pat? Right, so that's that's the mechanism. And sure. forgive me, I guess we're still saying really big picture. Let's we can get into the weeds here, but um yeah, this financial history is crucial to understand and it is interesting when you don't turn it into just uh just numbers. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. And it's also really relevant. A lot of things you were saying I was thinking about today and how <laughs> how extremely yeah, unfortunately bit, relevant. Huh? Well, and, and it so all this is, is th this is the key thing that I think it's glossed over lost you know to get into what is too complicated for history, right? Mm -hmm. As as these poor teachers are told, yeah, somehow convey everything mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, between say the Civil War and World War 1 in like a week. Cool. It's just a lifetime. No problem. Um, yeah. F five hours in the classroom. No, no sweat. <laughs> what more do you this, need? The, yeah. Especially when the students are definitely paying attention for at least 20 to 30 minutes of each of those, <laughs> you know, uh, classes. For sure. I digress. Um, this is such a rapid time of change for the United States. I think a, a key thing to lock in on to is that we have to remember how much the United States well, frankly, has already changed with the Civil War and even what it was going back to the revolution. If I can kind of sum this up in like 60 seconds, I'll try and do the impossible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we start in the colonial era at Lynn, as you know, and you just correct me if I get a little factoid wrong here or there, but we start with roughly 3 million people in the colonies. They see themselves as extremely separate. The, the Constitution mm -hmm. itself is a very difficult thing to get ratified. They call themselves states. And I think it gets lost on Americans today because now the word's baked in. Like states, that's the term for a country in the rest right. of the world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they're conveying something very intentional here. The Articles of Confederation, uh, right, the, the third article, they, they're very clear in saying, League of Friendship, people, this is not a country. 
League of Friendship. So it was a big deal to make that shift to the Constitution. We're like, okay, we're going to give up some legitimate sovereignty. And of course, that that shifts even more. The you know the first ten amendments are very much like. By the way, this is guaranteed individual rights, states' right no, number ten. Right? If it's not in the Constitution, federal government can't do crap. Well, mm-hmm. then we get out of the Civil War. We've we've really tested the bounds of this union, and the next several amendments are giving new powers to Congress, left, right, and center, with with this very broad statement essentially saying, whatever Congress needs to do to enforce this. It's cool. It, I may have slightly altered the words. I don't re- recall if it's cool actually made it into any of the amendments, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, so that shift is going on. And then think about what's been happening with technology. So again, to go back to the colonial era, it's a huge deal for someone to actually leave the colony in which they're born and go visit another. Plenty of people right. live, eat, breathe, mm-hmm. and die you know, within a few square miles. It's, that's not weird. Uh, weird is actually traveling. Uh, when we have the first Continental Congress, for instance, I mean, you've got some of these these founding fathers, and I, I think we sometimes forget about this. They're meeting for the first time. They've heard about each other, maybe. If, if mm-hmm. someone's really big, they they wrote a really cool pamphlet that's basically gone viral, to use our our terms today. They've never met. It, it, it's you can fly around the world today in twenty four hours. Getting from a northern colony to a southern colony, you, you better book several weeks just in travel alone to get there, let alone do your thing and get back, right? right? Now we've gone through a civil war, technology has changed, industrialization's happened, and we've got this transcontinental railroad, not to mention all these other railroads. And now you can ride across this continent-wide, sea to shining sea, United States in a matter of days. This is baffling. This is mind-boggling. And think about what that does to economies. And by the way, if I'm just talking too much, just say, Greg, shut up. We have a question. <laughs> you good? No, no this is great. You're doing a great job setting the all stage. Right. This is all, yeah. all right. important. I'll yeah. keep going. I'm very sensitive. I, at least I try to be to like, you know, someone asks a question like, oh, let me just give you five hours of information on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Chill out, Greg. I asked for a piece of cake not to be thrown into the oven with the batter. So, all right. So we've, we've got this nation that's now connected with uh, with trains and as we get out of uh, reconstruction we get into what we call the gilded age you know, we've mm. got tens of thousands of miles of railroad connecting the north the south the west it, you know all over the place we basically have the original amazon which is the sears catalog you've got homesteaders out in the middle of what they would c- consider nowhere uh, with their sears catalog literally ordering freaking houses you know, like right. people can get on Amazon today and you can order a little house. And I've had a few friends or family members like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Can't believe Amazon would do that. Pff, Amazon, sorry, but this is old, <laughs> old news. Old news. Like, just keep up, brother. We've <laughs> Sears beat you to the punch a century ago. And it was the real deal. It was a full house. So uh, that means the economies are shifting dramatically. And that brings another challenge to state conception. This is where we're going to start having Congress think through, okay, well, uh, states have traditionally handled their own economies. They regulate things. Do we have a role to maybe re- regulate stuff? Because right. suddenly it's not a local economy, right? You, you can you can have cows, uh, you know, herds in, in Texas that are getting run, ran up to Chicago where they're being sliced and diced. And now they're in a refrigerated train car and someone's eating that thing in New York a few days later. Sure. This is insane. Uh, just a you know a decade or two ago, so people remember just like you know s- some of us older millennials, we remember the the bygone era of the Dewey Decimal System and other mm-hmm. great archaic ways of life pre-internet. Um, you know th- that is what many older Americans in the Gilded Age they remember a much simpler world mm. right. where where things were not interconnected. So, what on earth does this have to do with Roosevelt and the Gilded Age? Okay, we think about wealth in the Gilded Age. What's exploded the amount of wealth? It's this new interconnected economy. So you've mm-hmm. got someone, if you, you go back to the revolution again, you've got like John Hancock, the dude is the wealthiest man in all of Boston. But notice that's where it stops, right? We, we think about him, we talk about his wealth in terms of Boston. We talk and think right. about see Thomas Jefferson in terms of his wealth in Virginia. You don't really have a lot of founding fathers, at least I, I've never even seen it come up colloquially or you know, in, in passing conversation where people are going, this is the wealthiest dude in the colonies. No one's even thinking in those terms. 
Right. It's so localized. So it's only with this interconnected world or United States rather that you can now have someone that is obscenely, you know, uh, wealthy, frankly, uh, on just a whole nother level. And it's that sort of wealth that has figures like Roosevelt, our, our, our buddy TR, to be clear, not, not Franklin. He's, mm-hmm. he's just a wee lad at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, debating and wondering what implications does this kind of wealth have on the Republic itself? Right. Right. And the role of the, the federal government as well. Yeah. Because the, the states, while you consider this again, if we go, if we roll back to John Quincy Adams, uh, a favorite New Englander of mine who I'd probably never enjoy meeting because that man had no personality. Uh, God bless his, his <laughs> intellect and brilliance. Uh, he's like the last guy you'd want to get a drink with other than maybe his own dad. But, um, <laughs> you know, he proposes a national road. He's got this American system, a, a, as it's called, that, that he's, he's pushing as he gets into his presidency, where we're going to build a road that connects the states and we're going to create a national university and we should have observatories. Congress is laughing him out, right? They're like, this is insane. Right. You can't do that. That mm-hmm. so supersedes authority. It's, this is just asinine, terrible. And, you know, a- a- Andrew Jackson rolls on in with the, that that's right. I'll, I'll play nice, you know, but we're very much simplifying the elections of 1824 and 28, but it, it, it's a loathed position. It's seen as not just like a different position. It's like not American. It doesn't even fit with America's concept of what the constitution permits. So by the time we get to the Gilded Age, technology has created so much wealth and interconnected the states in such a way that life is no longer as local and it's pushing what, well, you know, the group that we're going to start calling progressives to consider, does this mean that the federal government actually needs, not, not that they're necessarily even thinking through all these, you know, intellectual quandaries, but they're just seeing their very interconnected world. They see a world in which you can be in one state in the morning, be on, get on a train and be in another state that evening. Sure. And, and it just doesn't feel like this separ- these separated states as much. It feels like a single country. You know, I think you addressed this early in the uh, in the air episode um, about TR, which was that it seemed I knew him as like a trust buster, right? Like that's the the, right. the, the name that gets tossed around with the stereotype. But that's it right. seems to it, like but your contention, or at least what you were you were outlining at the beginning, was that he acknowledged the the role of corporate, like corporate, like people coming together and pooling capital. Yes. To accomplish big things. Like he had grown up seeing massive things accomplished. He, he understood the role that which that played um, in a way that I didn't realize because it, 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 in my head, he felt like an antagonist, at least in the, in the, the, the you know, uh, like the uh, uh, curriculum narrative of history. When you go like, oh, and Teddy Roosevelt came out on his horse and then he busted trusts with a hammer. <laughs> right? I, 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 you know, like that's kind totally. of like that version. Like he felt like antagonistic, but it wasn't that way at all. It seems. No, it, well, it's Isaac, this is again, it, too complicated, right? It, when mm-hmm. you've got five minutes and you're rolling over, over TR and you hit the highlights, okay, uh, something, something, uh, Spanish American war president, trust buster. And yeah, w- when all you hear is trust buster, it sounds like just, just what you said. I can't put it better. I won't repeat you. Um, but let's re- remember who he is to his roots. This is a blue blooded New Yorker. He, He's a Roosevelt. That is a big deal. He he comes from serious cash. Uh, he's writing histories himself. And part of it is that this is an era where history is written less by faculty members with the title historian. In fact, that's kind of a new thing in and of itself to see mm-hmm. that emerging. It's written by, um, well, if, if you're familiar with the term uh, noblesse oblige, the, the idea of kind of the nobility who have an obligation to give back to society. Yeah, America kind of has that on a different and perhaps lesser, maybe we'll just go a different way than, you know, traditional hierarchical, more monarchical. I'm out of archical words to use <laughs> Europe. Um, <laughs> but but there's still this idea that you come from money. Yeah, you give back. So you do things that don't make money. And as any historian will tell you, writing history is a great way to not make money. So oh, yeah. Ro- Roosevelt. <laughs> I've excelled you know, Roosevelt, at it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Well done to us. Yes. So, so Roosevelt, uh, he comes from that world. But at the same time, this is a guy who then embraces the American West, he turns into a full on cowboy. He wants to experience things outside of luxury. 
he is himself a very complicated person who, um, you know, is as comfortable sleeping under the stars with someone who has no education, grew up entirely you know, agriculturally, or is is starting to emerge more and more uh, working class, as he is at um, the you know the, the finest restaurants in New York, where he absolutely knows whether to reach for uh, the outside or the inside fork first. So it's. I think when we keep that in mind, it should help us to better grasp how this is a guy who can look at this rapidly grown massive economy and is able to appreciate everyone's role, uh, you know, and not fixate on either his singular experience as a really wealthy person who simply sees, yes, all of my friends, they own these businesses shouldn't the poor, you know, like a, like a Mr. Burns right. character on the Simpsons, right? <laughs> they should all just be so grateful for what I provide for them. And yet he's also rolled with and been with and has the, the sort of disposition himself, the heart to think about those who they're not getting that opportunity. Right. Uh, and he's able to see that it, yes, yeah, some people might be able to work hard and, and build out. But that's not always the case. And with the way that this economy has grown and this I, forgive me for beating up on it. I think it's so crucial to get that the monopolies that are being created, and this is why we talk about trust busting, why, why weren't the founding fathers or others talking about it? You don't have companies on this scale. Yeah, the only exist. thing you have, no. So you go back to the colonial era, the East India Company is perhaps the only company that, that was even in existence that could touch the likes of the trusts that now exist by you know, the dozens in Gilded Age America. And of course, we know what happened when the British Parliament decided that they would just go ahead and bail out the East India <laughs> Company. We got a tea party that, you know, well, and Boston we still are. runs on coffee to this day. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I have to say, I was a little wistful when you were talking in your episode about Roosevelt and how he didn't just strictly follow a party line and his notion of the square deal and that every American sort of deserves the same chances. And one thing that really hammered it home for me, and I'm from, um, I'm from Western Pennsylvania, from Pittsburgh. Uh, and when okay. you were talking about the coal, the coal strike and just the massive national crisis that this could cause and the fact that he wasn't, he was willing to listen to both sides and that, you know, the person who ended up helping him was the one who was also I think you said frenemy, which I really like. And I think that that is perfect in, in <sighs> their relationship, you. which is J.P. Morgan. Um, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, the coal strike and this idea of a square deal and especially, you know, the working conditions of, you know, why these coal miners were striking and why sure. it was so important? So I, I harped on the railroads at the gate, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever long tirade I, I gave there that I hope had some coherence to it. Uh, this is, the man, the, the railroads of the, uh, at this point, at the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, this is kind of like the internet and the uh, interstate freeway systems at once. It's both things. Uh, it is what ties the nation together. It's how everything moves. So again, you got your Sears catalog, or you're going to move to a different state, you're going to go visit family far, far away, unlike, say, early pioneers who went west and quite literally said goodbye to family knowing they would not see each other again, right. like, ever. Who does that, right? Like, right. in our era, th this is just insane to even, you know, fathom. Right. So the railroads changed everything, but the railroad functions at the hands of so many countless hundreds of thousands of workers. And among these massive conglomerate, huge companies that have emerged in this now national, truly national economy, not, you know, to what I was saying earlier, you, you'll definitely have some listener who's like, oh, but the states, they did have their commerce. Yes, of course they did. Don't, don't be stupid. Uh, but, you know, this <laughs> really like deeply connected, this isn't, oh, well, we've got one ship of cotton and now it's going to go up to factories in Massachusetts it, seasonally. We're talking goods are just flying across state borders left, right, and center. Uh, all of this is held together by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of workers. Uh, the um, Basically, th those railroads that you remember from Monopoly, 
mm-hmm. you know, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, Reading, uh, Aurora. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, there, these one of these companies alone employ tens of thousands, if not up to a hundred thousand plus people. Ooh. And I mean, th- these are it's, a, it's again by today's standards. Like that's a big company. Yeah, height. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's massive. That's and huge. Again. Yeah. Just a few decades ago, you'd have seen nothing like that whatsoever, mm-hmm. right? So they, they need the railroads to work, uh, but all these employees continue to get, you know, cut down and cut down on their pay or the pay stays stagnant, even as everything else goes up, wages stay stagnant. Uh, working conditions, you have children working. Uh, mm-hmm. The the And again, for historical context, uh, not saying I'm down with child labor. I hope that should not be misconstrued, but... <laughs> We're coming out of an agricultural world where, yeah, uh, state, state schools, you, you barely have states coming out of reconstruction going, you know what we should do? We should maybe fund education. Not a bad That's idea. Right. Let's, yeah. let's start doing that. That might be a good um, thing. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so you've got kids who they grow up knowing that they're going to work and work on the family farm. But increasingly, we've gone from an America, which if we go back again to the colonial era, sorry, I'll keep using that touchstone. But you know, the, the first census back in 1790 well, uh, Lynn, you probably know the exact number, but it's over ninety percent of the of the nation. They're they're farmers. This right. is a land of Jefferson's agriculture. <laughs> exactly. Yes, Jefferson's Jefferson's rolling over in his grave right now. But that's, <laughs> that's like, another story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> where where is my utopia of farmers? <laughs> Alas. So uh, you know, as that inversion is happening, as that shift occurs. Well, it's it's not like you have families go, okay, well, we're hanging up the plow and we're moving to the city and kids, you don't get jobs until you're in your teens and they should be something like until right. you're at least 18. No, it, you, you take those same habits. Also, you have bills to pay. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, if Johnny can carry coal, Johnny's going to go to work, even if he's eight years old. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. Yeah, and the need for currency and, mon- and income, bro, you you. you you touched on it when, in the podcast as well it, that you couldn't grow food anymore, so you had to buy it. So, like you know, the need for revenue for, for the family or income for the family was even more necessary because there was yes. no other way to subsist. You had to and, purchase stuff. And again, I mean, you, you gotta you know keep in mind how what a mind warp this has to be for the Americans living through this. The the father and mother who grew up themselves on a farm, and now. Th- they can't make ends meet or, you know, th- th- things are growing, things are urbanizing. They move to the city, they get factory jobs and those jobs don't pay quite enough. Okay. You know, the, the, the kids start working at the factory as well. Uh, I, I, let's not even, well, let's actually, uh, to touch on the immigrant story, right? Where you've mm-hmm. got these absolutely destitute, uh, especially as we get into the Ellis Island era, you know, uh, l- largely uh, initially more Irish and Scandinavian, and then it fades into, uh, Southern and South uh, Eastern European, where people, you know, no one wants to live like this, but it's it's all they can afford. They've got mm-hmm. families stacked into a single room of an apartment, let, let alone like a multi-generational family in one apartment. It, it, they don't have a choice. They're, they're trying to pay the bills. And this is what Roosevelt, he's willing to see. Like When he's a state legislator, for instance, I actually can't recall if I even included this one in, in, in the episodes, but, uh, you know, he... He's challenged on some legislation to go check out how how cigars are actually made. He he was taking kind of a more pro business uh, stance, and mm. this is again what makes TR TR. He didn't say, "Oh no, I know everything. I'm good to go." He said, "Sure." So he went and saw that cigars weren't in fact roll, rolled up in a factory. He met a family where mom, dad, and all the kids, down to any child old enough to move their little fingers intentionally, were sitting there in one cramped room rolling all day long. And, you know, it, it shifted his view. And this is where the square deal that he talks about, you know, he, he wants that for all Americans. He still understands the corporate side, though. That's what gets lost on so many people, um, where, where he just gets pigeonholed because that's what we like to do, right? We want everything to fit in just a mere tweet in terms of our understanding of anything and everything. I mean, there's a reason when we get to the 1912 election that the socialists are running against bull moose TR, who's even, who's moved even farther to the left himself by mm-hmm. that point than he was during his own presidency. He is still not acceptable to the socialists. He is not leftist enough. But, but this guy sees the need to have enough re, re, enough regulation to, it, it, my understanding of, of TR would, would be uh, to say that 
he sees the free market is actually at its freest if it is regulated enough to prevent monopolies from mm-hmm. strangleholding and choking it off. And that's kind of what his philosophy seems to go for, is a, enough of a free market that it encourages and incentivizes those with capital to keep rocking it, to keep seeing ways for them to improve their own situation, or for those lower on the pecking order to be able to ascend. But also, you know, realizing that if it's just left to its own devices in this new industrial economy, that massive monopolies will grow and they will encroach and choke off those uh, attempting to, to start up uh, enterprises that just won't have a chance in this David versus Goliath scenario. Given that, I had a question actually that came up when I was listening to um, the podcast because I think, I forget whether it was during the State of Union or whether it was just something that you had uh, interjected in telling his perspective on this. But I think he was saying it wasn't just because of any, re- like for no reason that they should be regulated. It was that people acting in conglomerates act with special privileges that are granted by the government when mm-hmm. they feel yes. like, hey, you can incorporate. Right. So it, it, did he see the liability, like the, the releases of from personal liability? So it, did he see that as sort of like, hey, this group, how much did that factor into it? Like, oh, if an individual is very responsible for what they end up doing. But these groups are not acting responsible at all. Like it, it, it's almost, did he see them as acting without responsibility? Is that sort of how that 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 perspective shaped out? I mean, even think about that. Right? I just the, that phrase so, sort of struck I, I, me. I think the moment that you're thinking of, and I think we can tease out uh, what, what what the answer is is here because again, we'll I'll just keep picking on the title of, of your excellent podcast. Too too complicated for me to just give you a yes or no here. When J.P. Morgan, who's who's uh, just founded uh, Northern Securities Trust. Now, let, let's get JP's perspective, okay? Uh, as JP sees it, he's done nothing wrong. He's incorporated this n- new company, Northern Securities, in New Jersey, because <laughs> to quote the great Lin-Manuel Miranda, everything is legal in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And in that <laughs> one state, you can, you can have a corporation that does nothing but hold stocks. Mm. No other state allows that. They're like, no, this is ridiculous. This is insane. But there's Jersey like, that's not a problem. We got you. (laughs) We'll we'll take that fat check for incorporation. Thank you. So the New Yorker descends down to to Jersey, writes an $80,000 check. Northern Securities is bored. This is what uh, TR first goes after. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the issue is that he sees Northern Securities Again, it's not basically it's it's not a real company in his perspective. All it does is hold stock and it's tying together a slew of railroads. I mean, this is you if you're playing the game Monopoly, you have bought all four and you are just rocking it now. OK, now for uh, from, from JP's perspective, he's obeying the law. And it, frankly, he, he is uh, the 1890 an- antitrust uh, uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, it really kind of should have shot these sorts of things down. But in 1895, the Supreme Court heard the case of, uh, of a, a sugar company. Um, it was E.C. Knight Company. There it is. It came back to me. Uh, E.C. Knight Company, which uh, didn't want to be broken up and owned 98% of all sugar production in the United States. The Supreme Court found that was not a uh, monopoly on the premise that they weren't basically abusing their status so that's what set okay. this this space for mm-hmm. a trust for a corporation to say hey it doesn't matter how big we are it doesn't matter what our market share is as long as we don't abuse those rights i think it's a similar argument that a lot of companies make today you know and, and, and like <laughs> some places mm-hmm. like the only like amazon you know it's hey we're not you know look we allow a marketplace for these things to exist we, we are not abusing hey. our position and uh, this is this, is, I mean, we're, we're the same beautiful, brilliant, stupid, territorial, everything <laughs> species now that we were a century ago. You know, it, it should not surprise us at all to find that, you know, uh, Mark Twain named the Gilded Age, and I'll go ahead and give him a different quote right now. And that is that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Sure. You know, it's, and, and it does rhyme. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with, you know, your, your point there, Isaac. I, I do sometimes get a little, well, there are two things I'm hesitant of. One, I never want to be a pundit. Um, right. I feel pretty strongly like his, not a like stay in your lane per se, but I, I, I'm not interested in being a, a reporter and a pundit. That that feels to me, like I kind of have my own personal moratorium on touching the 21st century. 
let, right, let it right. die down. Let, yep. <laughs> let classified documents come out, let the emotions get out of it. And then, and then I'll touch it, uh, you know, when I'm old and too senile to actually do anything. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> right. that, so, so that, that said though, yeah, you, you can certainly see, um, even though it's, we're not talking about the internet, we're not talking about a, it, it, the same sort of global economy that there are a number of differences to point out, but you can see that, that rhyming component. Uh, and yeah, and, I, I think the point of me bringing it up is not necessarily that like, oh, hey, look at how today is like that. But it makes right. sense that that argument held water because it's still, you know yes. what I mean? Like, it, yeah, how yeah. people at the time were like, that makes sense. Right. Oh, because and, it's, obviously, like, I buy it. You know, and, like, and by, you know, people do buy it today. Same thing. And by no means am, am I critiquing you're you're bringing it up. Yeah. I, no, I, no, I think no, it's no, totally no, fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I I try in as much as I can, whether I'm in the classroom or, or I'm podcasting, I, I just always want to. I want to convey that you make the connections. That's kind of the the big thing to me. If someone doesn't right. do that that work, for, you know, to to make connections themselves at the end, I feel like that uh, that's a, a crucial part of good pedagogy. You people, it, one, you're more inclined to make errors because I'm not. I'm smart enough to know. I'm not smart enough to have all the right answers. So right. I'll provide plenty of analysis, and I'm not going to connect those final thoughts. But two, for for others who make those connections on their own and, and they see these things and can challenge them in their own head. Uh, I just think it's more meaningful. So oh, that makes sense. Any, anyhow, yeah. Uh, so, so JP though he goes to the White House and you know he says to TR, he's like, "Hey, I mean, what what gives, man? Why why am I getting sued?" Again, this is pretty much a quote. That's definitely how you know posh New Yorkers <laughs> spoke yeah. in the time. And <laughs> uh, and you know the, the response from from uh, TR's administration is, "Yeah, we feel that you're violating uh, the." the law that this is not acceptable. And so he then says kind of in that domino way, like, well, you're going to come after me. Well, who's next? You're going after, after Carnegie, you know, you're going to start hitting steel and right. where does yeah. this go? And the response is, if we feel they're violating the law, yeah. right? the, 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 it's not a yes, no, it's not when you get this big, you attack. And in fact, this comes up when Taft is president, uh, Roosevelt decides he's very unhappy with with his his boy Taft. They were, you know, thick as thieves during his presidency. Uh, Teddy basically hands the presidency off to Taft and then goes to Africa to shoot massive animals. Um, th this guy just leads a crazy <laughs> life, right? Uh, for the for the Smithsonian, by the way, I, I feel like that's worth pointing out. He's again complicated; doesn't fit our modern day uh, concepts of how things work. He's a conservationist hunter, like he he. At, at this stage in his life, he goes hunting to get uh, specimens specifically that will be brought back to the Smithsonian. This guy just does, he will not fit in any box. You try to put him in one and he's, no, he, he refuses. He'll shoot his way out. <laughs> he will shoot his way out. <laughs> <laughs> He'll totally shoot his way out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ha, have me back some time. We'll just talk about my favorite stories of him throwing punches and shooting things yes. or whatever <laughs> this, he's like the most american american to ever america that's we'll that's have to my... start a patreon to have like a side episode just about those there things. you go <laughs> okay so so um, on on uh, oh i'm sorry i was just going off your tr i please. just wanted to to say that um when i was in grad school we a bunch of us nerds we used to do these things called presidential cage matches and we would pick two yes. presidents and then we would argue who would win in a cage match, the physical, but also, right, you right. know, could they think their way out of it? And when you mentioned that with TR, I just thought, OK, this I, I, I like this. This is reminded me of, you know, our little game that we used oh, to he, play because he'd be nerds. a contender. He, he'd be up there. You know, <laughs> I would want him on my side. Oh, you would him rail splitter. Uh, they would definitely both be on my dream team. Uh, anyhow, that's a whole nother thing. We won't go down that yeah. road, but he's upset. He's upset at Taft because Taft is basically doing what we think of when we, when we think through trust busting Taft is, if a, uh, if a trust is really big, he's attacking it. And part of what Roosevelt says when he runs against him in 1912 is that's not trust busting. We need responsible, big business because right. this is a big country and this is a global you know, world now. Those that are doing right, you, you need to leave them alone, Taft. You're an idiot for, for doing it the way you are. Now, let's also not forget, he is running for president again. He's challenging him. So, right. but, but he was speaking in good faith when he meant that, yes. like, hey, if you're not abusing your position, then it's cool. Yeah, yeah, he right. was. And see, like, this, this is all, this doesn't fit in a one paragraph in a textbook. Right. Right? Right. Because it, it, it just, it isn't this simple team labor or team capitalism. 
Right. And it's very subjective. I mean, it, it's well, when we think that you have stepped over the line that is invisible and we're not going <laughs> to spell it out to you, that's when we're going to attack you. And I will say my one of TR's I'm a I like TR very much um, down to his personality. Like I, mm-hmm. I've, I enjoy a very larger than life uh, figure. I, maybe I run my own mouth too much. So per, perhaps I, <laughs> <laughs> you got some listeners that are like, uh, yeah, he does. Um, but uh, T, TR's weakness, in, in my, my opinion, the thing that uh, about his presidency that I dislike the most is that smart as he is, capable as he is, and I love his moral drive on the square deal. I love that concept. He, he, he's not a legal mind like Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the things I love about Lincoln is he's so meticulous. I mean, even down to the way he he carries out uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, the timing of it, his thoughts on when to use an executive order versus pushing something through through Congress. This is a man who understands very much the the vital roles that laws play, how to attack a bad, a bad law, which isn't necessarily straight on. Sometimes it's hitting it from the side. Roosevelt, though, I mean, there's no there's no going to the side with Roosevelt. This, this dude is guns <laughs> ablaze and straight at whatever he thinks is an issue. So if it's morally wrong, you know, it, it, this, this very weak and frail boy who worked himself into a, to a massive figure, became a boxer, and then went out to the American West and threw down with gunslingers uh, when whenever they crossed a line in his in his book a moral line to be clear right mm-hmm. that, a man who is a police commissioner in New York this is a guy who believes in taking on bullies it's his it's been his mantra since he first got the crap beat out of him as a kid by a bully when he was barely able to breathe he, he had lung issues and was very frail and weak his his father got him a punching bag and set him up at basically their wealthy home gym and said Teddy, well, didn't say Teddy. He hated Teddy. But Theodore, you <laughs> got to build your body, right? <laughs> You've got to fight your fights. You can't be afraid to get a little blood in your mouth. And mm-hmm. he ran with that. So that comes to him as president, though. You know, he's where Lincoln would have been more inclined to sit back and go, okay, so we got these trust issues. What is the formula, the mathematics of the law? Right. There's TR basically just like, well, this is immoral. Screw that. I'm going to go take that guy on. Okay, but how, where, why? details for a lawyer to worry about exactly (laughs) yeah that's actually interesting um the difference between the two because i've often heard the difference between like a lot of countries have prime ministers and a president right they have two different positions and one of them is kind of the mouthpiece and the other one is the bookish mind right like they're serving two different like one person is operating the system and the other one is operating you know as a politician um Mm -hmm. and we only have one and it's interesting how you like sometimes we have a prime minister and sometimes we have a president like that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I like the way, thing, yeah. yeah, I like the um, way you put that. I, I never thought that through before. That's that's great, Isaac. Thank you for that. He he is a. Uh, I I think it's interesting to say that one of the phrases you talked about on the podcast was that he said that the Constitution was made for the people and not the people for the Constitution. I found yes. that very interesting in terms of uh, like it, it it yes the companies make sense. There was an ends. Like of some sort of public good or or pro, like you know public progress that seemed to be at the you know what what the the trajectory of where we should be going and when you strayed yeah. from that one way or the other that's when you need to be brought back into line and and but the means of getting there didn't really matter right big company accomplished the railroads great you know uh, whether that's a, or or hey we need to go take over the mines to pump the coal get the coal out of the ground the government needs to great right right um, that's interesting. And sort of like a pragmatic kind of approach um, that you, you don't see in a ton of, of presidents or a ton of politicians in general. But I guess he never really was supposed to be president, at least. Uh, yes, and <laughs> I am by no means c- celebrating the assassination of William McKinley. Uh, right. Good, loving father and you know all, all the things. Um, he's exactly what you'd expect from a, um, you know, to, just to know, I'm sure your listeners know better than this, but w- when I say a conservative Republican, which is what he was, that does not necessarily mean what it does now. We're talking right. over a freaking century ago, right? right. Uh, in fact, Republicans and Democrats, there's like almost no difference between the two <laughs> at, at that point. But sure. his assassination is the only way you would have ever seen right. someone like, well, for, for Roosevelt to, be, to become president. Because 
he did not o- obey the party line. Um, he, when they were considering putting putting TR on the ticket with uh, with McKinley, we need to remember that it was done to get him out of the way because this yeah. war hero, right? He was in mm-hmm. the Spanish American War, the Rough Rider, uh, charging up Kettle Hill, not San Juan Hill. That's one of my favorite little factoids to be uh, pretentious <laughs> about. But Battle of San Juan, that's fine. Um, it he's this hero that doesn't really jive and play nice with the Republican party. So no one wants to kick him out because you can't kick out your popular guy, but God forbid that man have any real power. So right. they, vice, vice president, president is the perfect place to put. <laughs> yes. Perfect. So, so but, in the corner. you know, this, this one strategist, oh, I'm going to kick myself later, but you know, he said that that's a terrible idea. You don't want to put him one heart beat away from the presidency. And everyone's like, ah, McKinley's good. Dude's in great <laughs> health. And then he gets assassinated, right? And, his, <laughs> yeah. and, and that analyst, his first thought, his first saying was, now that damn cowboy, that was his quote, that damn cowboy is the president of the United <laughs> States. Yeah, you never yeah. would have gotten a president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, because the party would never have let someone like that ascend through the system. Right. Right. Huh. At least that's my take. It really seems like, you know, when you talk about, for example, you know, the coal strike, he basically just wanted to step in and, you know, end it. And it seems like he's expanding the powers of the presidency at this time. And I mean, even now today we argue, is that something that the president should be able to do? Or, you know, is this the right of the president? Is this, you know, federal state? And so I'm interested in, you know, how much did he really expand the rights or the, the, the role, role um, of, of, the of the president, the power? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, would you consider it something that was was extremely impactful or was he just sort of starting the trend of a little bit more than a little bit well, more than a little bit see, more? I would say he's more within the already established trend of a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. I mean, okay, <clears throat> to, okay. to go back out the gate george washington of course is is the antithesis of that right our our the president who's constantly asking oh my gosh can i do this can i do that is this right. is this constitutional is it not right. there's jefferson like of course it's not constitutional there's hamilton like uh it's super constitutional we should do that <laughs> i got other plans let me show you what else i'm thinking about um you know and then even, even when you get to jefferson my one of my favorite comments jefferson writes this letter we you know we still have it it cracks me up jefferson mr you know states rights states rights states rights becomes president louisiana purchase presents itself Mm. So he has this letter, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's almost a quote. He write, he's writing to his buddy James Madison, and he uh, says, "We perhaps we should not emphasize the constitutionality of the question." <laughs> <laughs> when it suits your purpose, you know. Right. That's very so, funny. Oh, I I think it's hilarious. I don't remember which episode I I have that one in. I'm, but whatever episode I talk about Louisiana Purchase, it's in there. Um. Uh, you can follow the bibliography on, on my website and it, it, anyhow, yeah, you can find it, f- find the source if you'd like. But uh, a- Andrew Jackson is known at uh, the the attacks on him, the attack ads depict him as a king. He's got a crown. Right. And then, of course, Lincoln, mm-hmm. he suspends habeas corpus. He's the first oh, American yeah. president, you know, for uh, and I'll say American president because the CSA pulls the trigger on this before us. No mm-hmm. pun intended. Trigger war. Anyhow, um, conscription. <laughs> right, that the, the Confederate right. States conscript in 1862 and the U.S. falls in 1863. We end up with a, right. with riots in New York over it. Um, so this is this is this has been going on basically from you know, the day uh, at least since the day that um, <laughs> Jefferson purchased Louisiana and, <laughs> and whatnot. Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I, but I would say the progressive era. I mean, this is a time of massive federal expansion there's no question there Mm -hmm. uh the extent i don't know if i can give you a solid answer off the top of my head on how much roosevelt he he certainly expanded it but i think it's in that tradition and it's really the federal government's power i mean the creation of the fda for for instance uh interstate commerce uh being regulated these are all very new things as the united states tries to grapple with these uh frankly states that are no longer isolated little communities unto themselves, but these very interconnected places with families moving across them. And, and you know, in many ways, kind of what Europe's starting to, to experience with the European Union. 
I was going to say, in the course of a lifetime, right. we became basically larger than Europe. To like, yeah. To like, you know, who's you know, someone mm-hmm. who was born and that, you know, pre Louisiana purchase and died uh, post, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, California based, like, like, all the way, it gets yeah. to, like, all the way across the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, one lifetime, and we became yes. larger than a continent. Uh, so it, it's massive. You have people that were born and died. I mean, this has got to be someone who lived super long, but they watched the United States go from really like an al- just more than an alliance of small, little, tiny countries into this massive, you know, our, our unique federal system, but a nation state consisting of tens of millions of people. If someone lived long enough to actually make it to the turn of the, of the century, getting into 1900, I mean, you're looking at about 100 million Americans at that point. Yeah, and I'll cite again the con- the colonial ooh. era three million, hundred million. That's absurd, um, isn't it? So yeah, there's, there are <laughs> going to be growing pains, of course. Right. Absolutely. Um, we're getting close to a uh, uh, time here, and I just wanted to ask a slightly different question. Uh, I guess a variant on on what Lynn had touched on Still as it. a way to sort of sum up, um, and then I'll make sure we plug uh, that your show so everyone can go listen to more TR stuff. Uh, <laughs> Perfect uh, 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 on your feed, but do you think he was a um, an effective president, Roosevelt? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he, I mean, the the amount of legislation that got through, the things that he envisioned, something we didn't even touch on here to think about his his foreign policy. Um, the Panama Canal mm-hmm. is completed under uh, Woodrow Wilson, but it's that's really a TR driven project, mm-hmm. um, which massively, you know. Th- well, go listen to my episode on that to hear about all the, the moral considerations on, on all sides, but it absolutely connects the world and elevates the United States' uh, ability to interact with the world as they can now get ships uh, from one ocean to the other without right. it taking months. The trust that he busted, I would argue, while they're exceeded by Taft, they're more meaningful. Uh, mm-hmm. his, and perhaps that goes back to kind of who he's targeting, whereas Taft is just kind of like, that's big, I'll shoot that down. Um, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll shut up. Yes, the yeah, I think, is yes. I think, I think he was an effective well, president. I think his face belongs on on Mount Rushmore. I do. I, I think How's it's that? super interesting that, that that I mean, it's not interesting. I think you're 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 probably nailed it that he he is. And I, I was thinking back, and Lynn, we've talked about this before. Um, even in the creation of the Constitution, when the, the part of the argument for the executive was that we need more legislative energy, and what they meant by energy was that the federal government needs to be able to do stuff. Right. And he mm-hmm. seems like if, if any president embodied energy, like political energy, it might be this guy. Uh, at least, <laughs> that at least by your description of him. A ball yeah. of energy. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I mean, whether it's his workout routine, because he's like the only guy pre 20th century who works out, um, you know, <laughs> to, <laughs> right. to what he's doing legislatively. And I'll even point out that Woodrow Wilson, when the, when they clash in 1912, um, they're both progressives. They have very similar platforms and yeah, Woodrow Wilson wins really because the Republican base was split between sticking with the party or, you know, going with the cowboy who basically said, F this, I'm starting my own thing. Um, But uh, Woodrow Wilson falls into using Roosevelt's platform. So basically Woodrow kind of goes with as a Southerner and trying to appeal in the democratic party. Uh, progressive, uh, but states' rights, state level progressive, and sure. Roosevelt's like, you can't get crap done like that. That's that's ridiculous. It's it's federal. Uh, Woodrow learned some lessons when he got into the White House. So, and if I could just plug one specific episode, I also loved the one on conservationism um, because you know I I live near the um, Blue Ridge Mountains, the Skyline uh, Drive, and you know all of his work with. The wildlife refuge, yep. the national parks, and it's it's a really good episode. So if you're interested in any of that in general, definitely yeah. listen to that one. For I those really listening, I know we talked about a ton, and it was a little bit all over the place. But I, I think we have sufficiently argued that that Theodore Roosevelt is a little bit too complicated for the history books and whatever curriculum <laughs> you may have had in high school. <laughs> um, and you know, I implore you, it, it, it's one beautifully put together. Uh, Greg is a, is a great. Uh, presenter of the history uh, go check out history that doesn't suck episodes right around episodes 212 through 124 is around the, what, what, the era 112. That we're, or 112 sorry 112 yep, through 124 no um mm-hmm. it was around the episodes that we were talking about today uh and uh you yeah, know you can hear more and get like much more personal uh with um theodore and not teddy 
uh, that's right. That's in, right. In, in those episodes. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there any else besides, so besides your podcast, is there anywhere else our listeners can go and, um, uh, find updates on what you're working on or anything else you got, uh, got going? Are you any social media that you'd like to plug at the moment? Sure. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, htdspodcast.com is where it all really feeds to. Uh, I am just about to kick off, a. uh, national tour uh, you can find my tour dates on the website oh. um, i have a basically a live show that is as detailed in writing as any of my podcast episodes but you've got to pull out the guitar live so there's that oh. and uh in a hundred minutes nice. i'll take you through a hundred years of, of u.s history with all the the storytelling as we go from the revolution through uh through the civil war so uh lo love to see you in one of my audiences at some point and well they're bunch of shows on the history channel so there you go all right well thanks again for being here fantastic my pleasure thanks for having me yeah thanks so much thank you for listening to the full episode of too complicated for history we hope you enjoyed the episode and if you did please leave us a review on odyssey apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you get your podcasts be sure to follow us on our social platforms at 2c4h underscore podcast or check out the link in the description this will keep you in the loop for show updates new episodes and exclusive content too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins, edited and mixed by Curtis Fritch, opening theme music by Sheena Biratella.